Good morning, Grace. Love to hear your voices sing together and then greet each other. It's a lovely Sunday to be together worshiping God and then, of course, riding water slides and eating hot dogs. Um, I, you know what? Somebody told me the other day, I was eating a hot dog when they told me this. But they said, you know, uh, they did research, and every time you eat a hot dog, you lose 20 minutes of your life. <laughs> and I was sobered by that. I was a uh, little bit taken aback. But then later, I did the math, and you can eat like 2,200 hot dogs, and it only costs you a month <laughs> of your whole life. I think that's okay. <laughs> I'm willing to make that trade. <laughs> Uh, hey, if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to get to Acts chapter 4 in just a minute. We're starting a new series. If you don't have a Bible, you can slip up your hand. We'll put a Bible in your hand. Also, a note sheet, all the key announcements, things coming up around Grace, space for notes, prayer request card down at the bottom. You can get that with a hand in the air. Also, we have communion this morning that we're going to celebrate. And so if you didn't get elements on the way in, make sure you get that from our amazing Bible cart guys. And um, just a reminder about that connection card, prayer request card at the bottom, fill it out. We pray every week and we are honored to do so, to enter into intercession on behalf of our people to God. Um, our staff, our elders, we read those and we pray for those through the week. Oftentimes the way we can also follow up with you if you have needs. So you simply fill out the prayer card, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when it goes, no, not the offering plate, that's like 2019. Uh, we have offering boxes now. On either side of the room, you can drop those connection cards in the offering boxes. All right. Um, and let's see. One other thing to point out. One of the really fun things we do around here in June is these um, mother-daughter and father-son Bible studies for parents with tweens, which is like fifth through eighth grade, kind of that teenage, early teenage time. And Kamal told me that the mother-daughter tween Bible study is really full. There's like 74, uh, 75 moms and daughters, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I actually, I, in my notes, it just occurred to me, well, maybe you could have multiple daughters. I saw there's, there's 75 mothers and daughters. I was like, how would there be an odd number? But I guess you could have a mom with two tween daughters. On the other hand, uh, the father-son tween Bible studies sitting at 14. So dads, I know there's a lot of all-star baseball, I know there's a lot of travel ball, I know there's a lot of commitments, but just wanted to put it on your radar in case you missed the announcements. It's possible that the moms are a little more up to date with the announcements, but uh, it's another great opportunity to really connect with your sons and it's something that's really important for us as fathers to invest in our children. And that kind of does lead us into the direction of this new series, as I mentioned, we're going to be in Acts 4, but I need to work on a couple of ideas to get in our heads, um, positive witness and negative world, and then we'll get into Acts 4 to see what it looks like. So this is the summer series. If you've been around Grace for any period of time, you know that uh, oftentimes in the summer, we love to do a collective Grace Family series where multiple churches in the Grace Family all focus on a similar subject or set of scriptures, and then we'll even do a little bit of preaching rotation, and so I'll be preaching to a couple other Grace churches, a couple of the other pastors will be here, along with some of our amazing local Grace Nelville communicators. Should be a really fun summer, but this series is titled Witness, and it comes right out of the book of Acts, where in chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So basically a vision there. They're in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the next layer of geography, all the way out to the ends of the earth. Now, the word a witness, just because I thought you might like a little Greek, and if you're into like tattoos, I know sometimes people put Greek words on their bodies. I mean, this is a good one. Um, and it's pronounced martus. And in the book of Luke and Acts, it takes on this double meaning. It's someone who can and does speak from personal experience about actions in which he or she took part and which happened to him or her. So it's like this kind of firsthand experiential piece. But there's also a layer uh, of the word witness that 
describes the person who witnesses to facts, truths, or views that the speaker is convinced of. So that means this word witness is both experience and conviction. And as you read through Luke and Acts, you see that those books of the Bible are really concerned to show that the way of Jesus is not just an idea, it's not just a myth, it's not just a speculation, it's not just a philosophy, but is actually based on facts which took place in the clear light of day in the light of history at specific times and places. That word witness carries with it an emphasis on speaking, that you're not properly a witness until you testify, that is, put into words what you've experienced and what you are convinced of. And then one last thing to note, when followers of Jesus were persecuted and killed for their faith, they came to be known as martyrs which in Greek is this same word, martus. But I think we can all agree that witness is a better summer series title than martyr. (laughs) And as we read the stories of people sharing their faith in the book of Acts, that is witnessing to Jesus, it's provocative. When people started talking about Jesus, stuff started to happen. There were miracles and riots. There was reconciliation and the experience of judgment. There was life change and jail time. But the point remains that the first generations of Jesus' followers took his words to heart. They were witnesses to Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now one of the books that's been really helpful for me in planning and preparing for the summer is written by Michael Green. It's called Evangelism in the Early Church. It's a really, really good book. It's a little bit academic, but I have confidence in you. If you wanted to read it this summer, I think you'd make it through. And uh, in his chapter about evangelism and their motives, why did the early church share their faith, he has this amazing quote. He said, the enthusiasm to evangelize, which marked the early Christians, is one of the most remarkable things in the history of religions. Here were men and women of every rank and station of life, of every country in the known world, so convinced that they had discovered the riddle of the universe, so sure of the one true God whom they had come to know that nothing must stand in the way of their passing on this good news to others. They were, without a doubt, enthusiastically evangelistic. How does that apply today? Those first few minutes there, I just wanted to give a snapshot. We'll go much deeper in the weeks ahead, but just give a snapshot into the way that the early church were enthusiastically evangelistic. And remember the word evangelistic, it comes from euangelion, it means the good news. So they were enthusiastically good news people. They gave a positive witness to Jesus in, at the time, what was very much a negative world that throughout the Roman Empire and even among the Jewish community, as we'll see in a moment, there was enormous opposition. The cost of following Jesus was really high. They were a positive witness in a negative world. Now I use that phrase, negative world, intentionally because it borrows from an article that was published in 2022 called The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism written by Aaron Wren, R-E-N-N. And this article eventually developed into a book that came out last year called Life in the Negative World. But this article is Aaron Wren wrestling with what has happened to our culture and what has happened to the identity and role of evangelicals in our American culture over the last 50 or 60 years or so. And so he starts off in this article talking about how the 1950s were really the high water mark of 
Christian participation in the United States, that church attendance was over 50%. More than half the people in the country went to church every Sunday. But then, beginning in about the 1960s, that evangelical high watermark started to decline. And so he says there was a phase or an era of American culture starting in kind of the 60s, and he ran it up into about the mid-90s, and he called that the positive world. He said during that time, even though evangelicalism was in decline, it was still positive to be a Christian. If that was on your resume, it might help you find a job. Generally in schools, there was prayer and there were Bible studies in the kind of public school situation. Like it was still a positive world for Christians. He says in 1994 or so, it began to shift from being a positive world to what he calls a neutral world where it was neither a big benefit nor was it a negative to be a follower of Jesus, to be an outspoken Christian. Well, why does he say 1994? Well, in the article, you can read it. It's free online. Um, but also his book, he, he talks about a few factors in that era of the mid-90s where things started to shift from positive to neutral. He, he talked about the end of the Cold War in the late 80s being significant for culture. He said he chose 1994 because that was the year that Republicans took over the House of Representatives. It was sort of a um, big moment for populist Republican politics. Uh, he says that was the year Rudy Giuliani was elected the mayor of New York, which also signaled this sort of beginning of a re-emphasis on urban renewal that became very important for many Christians through the 90s and the early 2000s. And then he says there was another shift, and he puts this one around the year 2014, when things went from neutral to negative. And what he means there is that after about 2014, 2015, if you are an evangelical, it actually comes not with social benefit, but often social costs, particularly in the eyes of society's elite. So think political world, educational world, universities. Um, at this point now, if you start putting that you're a Christian on your resume or people find out that you're a Christian, they can tend to look at you a bit more negatively. Why? Well, because society and culture, the, the world we live in in the United States, shifted so much so that the new morality, the new goals of society that the general public, and especially that kind of elite world are agreeing upon, are in direct conflict with many of the core Christian convictions. So let me put this on a little grid for you. There we go, 94, pre-94 positive world, the 2014 neutral world and the negative world. And I'll give you a couple of illustrations that Aaron Wren uses to sort of underscore his point. And again, we're talking big general terms here, but it's helpful to get our heads around the world we're living in. He talks about candidates, presidential candidates, uh, presidential uh, presidents, and he talks about how in 1987, Gary Hart was the leading candidate for the Democratic nomination to run for president. And in 1987, it came out, there were rumors that Gary Hart had had a young woman stay the night with him at his townhouse. And it blew up into this enormous scandal, and it was actually so scandalous that Hart had to withdraw his candidacy from the race. Now, Wren talks about, that's, that's the sign of a positive world, right? The things are kind of positive, Christian values are in place. You get this idea that you have a presidential candidate who might have committed adultery and it gets into the public sphere and it's like, no, you can't do that. You can't have a president like that. Then you get into sort of this next era, the neutral world, and Wren talks about the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal. And he talks about it was harmful for Clinton, but it was not so harmful that he lost his place or had to withdraw his candidacy or anything like that. He just got reelected. That's a sign of the neutral world. And of course, 
in the negative world, well, it seems like we will elect candidates whose history with scandal is substantial. And those are indications of how society at large, I'm not talking about you and me, I'm not talking about, talking about people who, who call in the name of Jesus, I'm talking about society at large, how morality and culture is being shaped. One more quick uh, illustration. This is pastors praying at inaugurations. 1989, the inauguration of George H.W. Bush. Who does the invocation? Billy Graham. And, you know, he's America's pastor. And it's like, yes, of course, Billy Graham. After Obama was elected, uh, the January 2013 inauguration, uh, Louis Giglio was supposed to do the invocation. If you don't know Louis, he is a pastor here in the Atlanta area. He's been a great leader and pastor for a long time and a really faithful guy. In the lead up to the invocation at the inauguration, it came out that Louis held and holds a traditional view of marriage and sexuality. And the kind of pushback on that grew and grew and grew to the point where Louis himself withdrew. He said, no, it's not worth, the juice is not worth the squeeze on that. So again, you see the shift there. Billy Graham, great, do the invocation in the positive world. In the neutral world, you got Louis and it's kind of, yeah, I'm not sure, kind of back and forth, Louis withdraws. Example from the negative world in 2017, Princeton Seminary, you know, whose stated goal is to train pastors and leaders, decided to give Tim Keller, the pastor up in New York City, uh, the prestigious Kuiper Award, named after Abraham Kuiper, a great Dutch theologian. And this was to honor him for the work he had done on behalf of the kingdom of God and Jesus. Well, when the student body at Princeton Seminary and professors and other people caught wind of the fact that Princeton was about to honor someone who was theologically conservative like Keller, there were protests and all sorts of hubbub and uproar, pushback. How could we honor someone like Keller whose values aren't just on par with the neutral world, but whose values actually are in conflict with culture's direction? How, how could that be possible? And so Princeton, this time it wasn't Keller. Keller never even asked for it. He was just, you know, hanging out in New York. And they're like, hey, you're going to win this award. And then six months later, and a whole bunch of news articles, and a bunch of uproar later, Princeton was like, never mind, we're not giving you the award. <laughs> Illustrations of a negative world. Now, Wren goes on to talk about how each of these worlds had uh, kind of triggered a different strategy among evangelicals. He talks about in the positive world, the primary evangelical strategies were to be seeker sensitive and also to engage in what he says is the culture war. I'm just borrowing from his article here. When he talks about being seeker sensitive, he's talking about some of these large churches, Willow Creek in the Chicago area, started by Bill Hybels, who many of you know, wiped out morally, uh, but it was a very, very influential church movement. And Hybels operated under the assumption that most people kind of wanted to go to church if church was just engaging enough for them. And so he went door to door, he interviewed people, he found out why people weren't coming to church, then he, they changed kind of what happened on Sundays, and that gave rise to a bunch of really big, like, suburban mega churches that followed this seeker sensitive model. And the seeker sensitive model works pretty well in a positive world because people are predisposed to be favorable toward Jesus and Christianity. Also, during this time, there was a lot of talk about the culture war. If we could just elect the right people, they will enact the right policies that will change the cultural evils that we see. Of course, abortion was one of the major issues in the culture war time. And in a positive world, it actually made sense that you could mobilize enough people to elect the right leaders, to get the right policy in place, and so eradicate abortion. Those, those are strategies. You're gonna change the culture. We're gonna attract seekers. Positive world strategies. As things shifted into the neutral world, 
so also did much of the engagement of the church. People began to sense, as evangelicals, there wasn't this moral majority, if there ever had been, and so it became important to engage with cultural issues on a kind of peer basis. Sure, this is what the secular world is saying, here's what Jesus is saying, let's all have this conversation. And we're able to because it's mostly a neutral world. But then as things began to shift, and part of the reason Wren says 2014 was so significant is you had during that time, like Ferguson, Michael Brown, uh, getting shot, that was 2014. That gave rise to a whole host of conversations about race and injustice in the United States is sort of wrestling with how our history, our present and our future will play out. Uh, you also had the Obergefell decision legalizing gay marriage in 2015. And so suddenly after this period of time, these strategies, seeker sensitive, cultural war, cultural engagement, actually don't make that much sense anymore to the large kind of culture. Why? Well, we're not gonna win the culture war, we're not a majority. Seeker sensitive, well, right now, the number of people who are just completely unaffiliated religiously, sometimes it's called the nuns, they have no uh, none, n their affiliation with religion is none, uh, is, is higher than it's ever been. It's around a third of young people uh, in their 30s and younger. And so it's like most people these days, if they're not going to church, it's not because they don't like it. It's because they they're not even interested in being part of a church. So the seeker sensitive thing, cultural war doesn't really make sense. And cultural engagement is extremely difficult because if we bring our views, for instance, of a traditional biblical sexuality in marriage into a conversation where the general culture has completely abandoned that and actually sees that view as anti-human, well, cultural engagement is not gonna work because they'll kick you out before you even get to the door. And Wren then, helpfully at the end of his article says, we don't know what the strategy is for this one. Like I'm reading along, I'm like, okay, I'm tracking, I'm tracking, this is good, this is helpful, great, I can't wait to the end when he tells me what to do, and he finishes the article, like, we're not sure what this is gonna be. And I, uh, you know, his book, I guess he developed some ideas a little bit more, I've spent some more time with his, his material. I spend all that, all that many words that we just went through to establish sort of the second idea that's really crucial for this summer series. The first one, you got the early church, enthusiastic, good news people. They are a positive witness in what was a negative world, the Roman Empire, the Jewish community. I mean, so many things were negative against them. Now, we come into our current day and we're asking the question, what does it mean as followers of Jesus to be a positive witness in what has become a negative world for us. And this really, I think, helps frame up what we're gonna do this summer as we try to read, understand, and apply the evangelistic encounters in the book of Acts. And we're gonna talk about who's a witness, what is a witness, where does God call us to be a witness, how do we witness, when do we witness, why do we witness? And all of it aiming at kind of walking with the Holy Spirit into this space. Lord, what's the strategy for us as a local church today to be a positive witness in a negative world? And we're actually gonna work on that basic question, why do we witness out of Acts 4? And so as you're there in Acts 4, just a reminder, the first three chapters of Acts. Acts chapter one, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit shows up. That's the day of Pentecost. The disciples go out in the streets of Jerusalem, preach Jesus' resurrection. 3,000 are added to their number that day. Acts chapter three, sometime later, but not too much longer after Pentecost, 
Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray and they encounter a poor man, a beggar who has been lame from birth and they heal him in the name of Jesus. And it seems like this man was a regular part of the scenery for anyone heading up to the temple, like he'd been begging there for a long time. And then all of a sudden after this miracle, he's walking and jumping and praising God. And this draws a crowd, as you might expect. This prompts Peter to begin preaching. Peter begins witnessing. And he's talking to his fellow Jewish community there on the Temple Mount. He says in chapter three, verse 15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. And then he says, repent so that your sins might be forgiven and that times of refreshing might come from the Lord. I love that phrase. I've always loved that. Times of refreshing. Hallelujah. Riding down those water slides would be like a time of refreshing. It's like a little foreshadowing. The times of refreshing from the Lord. And so this is where we pick up in Acts chapter four. The crowd has gathered, the lame man has been healed. Peter is preaching repentance toward Jesus and it says the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So they're trying to clamp down on Peter and John, negative world, trying to shut down their witness, but it's too late, the text tells us, the word has gotten out, another 2,000 join the number. Verse five, the next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anas, the high priest, was there. So were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. Now, if you've been reading straight through from the book of Luke into the book of Acts, because remember, Luke and Acts, same author, kind of part one, part two of the story, life of Jesus, life of the church and the Holy Spirit. If you've been reading straight through from the book of Luke, and you come across these names, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, high priest's family, these religious leaders are the same shady characters who had been so instrumental in the plot to betray and crucify Jesus. Verse seven, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Gosh, it's so good when you read it. (laughs) Whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note, these men had been with Jesus. Man, there's a whole sermon series in this verse. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. I, you know, I love that description, unschooled, ordinary men. And part of the idea here is that anyone in partnership with the Holy Spirit can be a fruitful and powerful witness. Anyone, unschooled, ordinary, doesn't matter. At the same time, I remember when I first read that, I was like, oh great, that's, so, that's super, super awesome. But we gotta be careful, we don't mistake where they started with where they are in this story. Because they had been with Jesus in the original D group, the first discipleship group, 
for three full years. And it didn't just meet at 9 a.m. on Sundays and have a dinner every other Wednesday night. I mean, it was like they were there with Jesus three full years walking with him. Now, for a long time, the standard seminary preparation for a minister or preacher has been the Master of Divinity degree, an MDiv sometimes it's called. And it's a full-time, three-year degree, minimum 72 credit hours, 24 classes you have to take to get an MDiv. Compare that to the disciples who were with Jesus 24 hours a day for three years. And I do think we can agree that in addition to being God's perfect prophet, priest, and king, he's also the best professor in all of history. And so it's true that Peter and John came straight out of the blue collar fishing boat, ordinary unschooled men, but never mistake them for being unserious or untrained yokels from Galilee. They knew their stuff by this point. They'd been with Jesus. Verse 15, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. So then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? Amen. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. What a story. And in here, just with the few minutes we have left, I want us to ask the question, why would we witness? And we see in Peter and John three reasons, concern, responsibility, and identity. They stand up to be a positive witness in a negative world, number one, because they have a real concern for the lost. As they're speaking there, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says salvation is found in no one other than Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And it's amazing to me that Peter says this to the people who are directly responsible for Jesus' death. I mean, these guys are their greatest, worst, most conniving religious and political enemies. And Peter is standing there in front of them trying to share the good news with them too. Because Peter and John understood from Jesus what a person is. I love the definition that Dallas Willard gives of a human being. He says, we are unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. And if that is indeed our nature, then what Peter says there in verse 12 is profound. Salvation is found in no one else. The discovery of our eternal destiny in God's great universe, if we are unceasing spiritual beings, requires a relationship with Jesus. And in the absence of a relationship with Jesus, Peter says there's no hope to be saved. And so Peter and John, they are motivated by the concern for the loss, the eternal consequence of people who go to their graves rejecting Jesus. 
And this is a challenging subject. There's a huge debate these days in various Christian circles about the precise nature of hell and judgment. Is it eternal torment? Is there literally fire? In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis imagined hell as infinite isolation where people just keep moving farther and farther and farther away from each other in the absence of the presence of God. And while it's true that Jesus talked about Gehenna or hell more than anyone else, almost all of his language about hell was metaphor, describing the metaphysical, which is a big word way of saying. Jesus uses word pictures to describe judgment beyond what we can fully understand. And so there are valid debates about precisely what Jesus meant what the scriptures say about hell. But there are not debates about the reality of God's judgment. And so even when I preach here at Grace, I rarely talk about hell unless it's there in the text. But I will speak about judgment and God's judgment. And the truth is, to the ears of our all-inclusive culture, where everybody needs to follow their heart and you do you. And you know, as long as you don't harm anybody, you can just be whatever you want. In, in, in the ears of that all-inclusive kind of culture, that negative world, to speak of judgment like this is a very renegade word, a very renegade idea. The idea that Jesus would be the only way to salvation is even more renegade. But Peter says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And in the teaching of Jesus, again and again and again, when he goes to describe humanity, he uses two categories. He says there's the people who walk the broad way and the people who find the narrow way. There's the people who serve God and there's the people who serve mammon or money. They're the sheep, there are the goats. There are wheat and there are tares. There are wise bridesmaids, there are foolish bridesmaids. There are those who accept the invitation to the wedding feast, and there are those who don't. And it's with that compelling categorization, if we are indeed unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in God's great universe, Peter and John are concerned that people would come to know Jesus because his is the only name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Now secondly, it's not only concern, why were they witnesses? Well, they felt a strong sense of responsibility. And the responsibility was actually to God. When the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, commanded them not to speak any longer in Jesus' name, Peter and John replied, well, which is right in God's eyes? Do we listen to you or or do we listen to him? You guys be the judges. They sensed responsibility to obey God. Now the Bible's teaching on eternal judgment is sobering and it's challenging. It raises a lot of questions, like how can that judgment be just? How could God condemn a person forever based on the few finite years of their life? Uh, What about a person on the other side of the world who never met anyone, who follows Jesus, or can't even read the Bible in their own language because it hasn't been translated yet? How does this all work? Like, as soon as we start talking about eternal judgment, the questions arise. And I have wrestled with the exact same questions, deeply and profoundly. They are important questions. And what I've found is that in the end, we have to trust Jesus, who is the eternal word of God. He's the expression of God on the earth. He's what God wants us to know. He is the second person of the Trinity in human flesh. And what we see when we look at Jesus is that he is utterly compassionate, that he is merciful, that Jesus sees everyone, listens to everyone who would seek an audience with him with an open heart. He's always seeking a person's best, always inviting us to trust him without coercion or manipulation. And so when it comes to the difficult questions about judgment and eternity, we have to trust the character of God, 
that there are some unanswerable things on this side, but we can trust God to be just and good. And in the meantime, that being said, we do have a command as followers of Jesus to be his witnesses and to make disciples. And sometimes I have this tendency that before I do something, I need to understand something. I think I passed this on to my children. It's a hereditary gift I gave them. Like yesterday afternoon, time to do some yard work. Guys, I need your help with the yard. But why? Why do we have to do this? This is so unfair. It's like, how is this even unfair? This is me and Amy debate with our kids all the time about the fairness of things. Because they're like, it's so unfair, I have to put my clothes in the drawer. It's like, we've put your clothes in the drawer for 10 years. Uh, no, eight, I guess. <laughs> it felt like 10, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and my kids will ask, like, well, why, why do I need to work in the yard? And because I understand, I want them to understand, it's like there's a part of me that wants to explain, well, it looks very much better, and if we don't prune back the hedges, that it'll make too much moisture in the wood frame, and there'll be rot in the house, and also, I, you know, I want you to work on the yards, so you learn how to grow up to be responsible, mature humans with life skills, you know? I mean, like, I kind of feel like I, I need to explain all that, give all the background of what my plan is for them and their whole life. But actually, I just need you to put the clippings into the yard bag. You know, like, sometimes, I just need my children to obey. And there is this give and take, isn't there? Where sometimes we need to understand some things in order to step into responsibility. And sometimes we need to step into responsibility so that we can understand some things. And this is part of what it means to be a child growing up. It's part of what it means to be a parent raising children. And it's part of what it means to follow Jesus. He told us, you will be my witnesses. He said, go and make disciples of all nations again and again. To follow Jesus comes with the responsibility that we will be witnesses Amen. to Jesus. And there is a part of being witnesses that is simply obedience. Why witness? Well, because the Lord told us to. <laughs> Jesus said this is an important part of who we are. And when we ask questions about a broken world, and when we wrestle with people who don't yet follow Jesus, and wrestle for people who don't yet follow Jesus, family members, kids, parents, who, who, who aren't following Jesus, like these hard questions, or, or when we just try to grasp why there's so much suffering and injustice and war in the world, and, and we just say, God, I don't understand why. Like, what's your plan in all this? You know what the Lord replies? You will be my witnesses. Amen. God says, I came, I died, I was raised again to undo the power of sin and death. And then I sent the Holy Spirit into you. And even though the world will never be fully right until I return, you will be my witnesses. Amen. And so we have to live in this healthy place where we feel the responsibility that he's given us to be witnesses, a positive witness in a negative world, healthy responsibility without feeling like we carry the weight of the world's salvation on our shoulders. And this is why I love even the way Peter explains his sense of responsibility, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. Peter says, I am listening to God. And the Holy Spirit, remember, that is filling Peter in this very moment, the text says, is leading him into obedience in this area of witness. There's a dynamic relationship where they are able to step into sharing the good news. Amen. And their concern, as you read through the book of Acts and you wrestle with how they lived out this life of being witnesses, truly, their, their concern was that they would be consistent with their calling, that they would have integrity with the faith they professed. If they really believe Jesus is the only salvation, well, integrity and consistency would say, it's important that we talk about Jesus being the only salvation with other people. And 
it was more for them about their own sense of obedience to God than about how others would stand before God. Like as you read through this and you read through the way Paul writes about being an apostle and a witness, like again and again, their concern was to be faithful to what God had asked them to do because they could trust God's character with the world. They were saying, Lord, what are you asking me to do? Because I want to listen to you and how to be a witness and how to be a positive witness in a negative world. And the last reason why, and we barely have time to get into it, but it's like the best one, is what we find in Peter and John is their identity has become so intertwined with God that they say, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. You you know what that means? It means talking about Jesus for them isn't something they have to do. It's something they get to do. It's who they are. They just can't not talk about Jesus. I I don't know if you've ever been around someone who's become a grandparent for like the first time. (laughs) And all of a sudden they have this new identity. I was a parent for a long time, now I'm a grandparent. And like they pull out their phone and they start like scrolling pictures of their grandbaby. It's like, yeah, I've seen a bunch of those. I'm a parent, man. I got those at home. But they're like on fire to share the good news, the fact that they have grandbabies and they are grandparents. And I love it. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a healthy, healthy, wonderful thing. The point there is that when your identity changes, you just can't stop talking about what has changed your identity what you've seen and what you've heard. And so these guys, Peter and John, are there and their identity's been changed. They've come to know Jesus and the whole world looks different to them. Every day smells different to them. They have the Holy Spirit alive in them. Like, everything has changed. This is who they are. Why be a positive witness in a negative world? Because your identity has changed. It's who you are. You are now a good news person. And sometimes we can get wounded and that can hurt our witness. Bad stuff happens, we feel like the Lord lets us down, we fall into despair, we fall into apathy, we fall into difficulty. There are wounds and the Lord works with us through those and heals us. Sometimes we get the idea that we are warriors, we gotta get out there, we're gonna change the world. I think the Lord might gently have a word for us as a church to say, no, I called you to be witnesses. Is there time to stand in the battle? Yes, Ephesians 6 talks about that, but the word there is to stand firm, not swing your sword. You have the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, and that sword is the words of witness that we have. Yeah, sometimes we get wounded and sometimes we try to do too much as warriors, but the Lord calls us to be witnesses. And the Holy Spirit wants us to be healed and humble. Because when we're in a place of wholeness and humility, we just can't stop speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. The good news is that we have new life in Jesus. Death has been defeated, sin is forgiven. That we are indeed unceasing spiritual beings who are actively discovering an eternal destiny in God's great universe. But we all know this, we can't give away what we don't have. And so the Holy Spirit is the essential prerequisite to being a witness. I invite you to take your communion elements and uh, just remember the night before Jesus was crucified, he took bread, broke it, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat it, it's my body broken for you. And then he passed the cup and he said, take and drink this, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. For it's the blood of the new covenant, this new community of people. And so, as we talk about concern for those who don't yet follow Jesus, the lost. 
Remember, Jesus gave himself to save the lost. When we talk about our responsibility to listen and obey what the Lord has told us. Remember, the reason we do that is because we're redeemed, bought with a price. Our lives, our bodies, they're not our own anymore. As you think about our identity, why would we witness as people who are healed and humble? Our identity is found right here in Jesus, the one who came and laid down his life and rose again. So I love the word that Lindsay gave us at the beginning of the gathering, confession. An opportunity for us to come before the Lord and to confess simply means to say the same thing as in Greek. So you're basically telling God what he already knows about you. But as we're reading these scriptures, if they have provoked anything in your heart, take a moment and share it with God. And maybe join it to a simple prayer of gratitude that says, Lord, thank you for what you've done. And thank you for who you are. And thank you for who you've made me to be. And so Lord, we hold these elements, remembering that we need you, that there's no other name under heaven given among mankind by which we must be saved. And so Lord, we hold these tangible elements of communion, your body and your blood. And we say, thank you. And we confess. And we also, Lord, we we welcome your Holy Spirit to fill us, to make us positive witnesses in a negative world. So together we eat this bread. And we drink this cup in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching this Grace Snellville video. We want to help you get connected to everything happening around the Grace Snellville community. We want to pray with you, and we want to help equip you to follow Jesus well. Would you just take a moment, even now, to go to our website at gracesnellville.com. We hope to see you soon.